Original sin, also called ancestral sin, is the Christian doctrine of humanity's state of sin resulting from the fall of man, namely the sin of consuming from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, stemming from Adam's rebellion in Eden. This condition has been characterized in many ways, ranging from something as insignificant as a slight deficiency, or a tendency towards sin yet without collective guilt, referred to as a sin nature, to something as drastic as total depravity or automatic guilt of all humans through collective guilt. The concept of original sin was first alluded to in the 2nd century by Ionius, Bishop of Lyons in his controversy with certain dualist Gnostics. Other church fathers such as Augustine also developed the doctrine, seeing it as based on the New Testament teaching of Paul the Apostle and the Old Testament verse of Psalm chapter 51 verse 5. Tertullian, Cyprian, Ambrose and Ambrosiasta considered that humanity shares in Adam's sin, transmitted by human generation. Augustine's formulation of original sin was popular among Protestant reformers, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, who equated original sin with concupiscence, affirming that it persisted even after baptism and completely destroyed freedom. The Jansenist movement, which the Catholic Church declared to be heretical, also maintained that original sin destroyed freedom of will. In Judaism, Jewish theologians are divided in regard to the cause of what is called original sin. Some teach that it was due to Adam's yielding to temptation in eating of the forbidden fruit and has been inherited by his descendants, the majority, of Chazalic opinions. However, do not hold Adam responsible for the sins of humanity, teaching that, in Genesis chapter 8 verse 21 and 6 to 5 minus 8, God recognized that Adam did not willfully sin. However, Adam is recognized by some as having brought death into the world by his disobedience. Because of his sin, his descendants will live a mortal life, which will end in death of their bodies. The doctrine of inherited sin is not found in most of mainstream Judaism, although some in Orthodox Judaism place blame on Adam for overall corruption of the world. And though there were some Jewish teachers in Talmudist times who believed that death was a punishment brought upon humanity on account of Adam's sin, that is not the dominant view in most of Judaism today. Modern Judaism generally teaches that humans are born sin-free and untainted, and choose to sin later and bring suffering to themselves. The concept of inherited sin is also not found in any real form in Islam. Some interpretations of original sin are rejected by other Christian theologies. History of the Doctrine The formalized doctrine of original sin was first developed in the 2nd century by Ionius, the Bishop of Lyons, in his struggle against Gnosticism. Ionius contrasted their doctrine with the view that the fall was a step in the wrong direction by Adam, with whom Ionius believed his descendants had some solidarity or identity. Ionius believed that Adam's sin had grave consequences for humanity, that it is the source of human sinfulness, mortality and enslavement to sin, and that all human beings participate in his sin and share his guilt. The Greek fathers emphasized the cosmic dimension of the fall, namely that since Adam human beings are born into a fallen world, but held fast to belief that man, though fallen, is free. They thus did not teach that human beings are deprived of free will and involved in total depravity, which is one understanding of original sin. During this period the doctrines of human depravity and the inherently sinful nature of human flesh were taught by Gnostics and Orthodox Christian writers took great pains to counter them. Christian apologists insisted that God's future judgment of humanity implied humanity must have the ability to live righteously. Augustine Augustine of Hippo taught that Adam's sin is transmitted by concupiscence, or hurtful desire, resulting in humanity becoming a mass adaminator, with much enfeebled, though not destroyed, freedom of will. When Adam sinned, human nature was thenceforth transformed. Adam and Eve, via sexual reproduction, recreated human nature. 
Their descendants now live in sin, in the form of concupiscence, a term Augustine used in a metaphysical, not a psychological sense. Augustine insisted that concupiscence was not a being but a bad quality, the privation of good or a wound. He admitted that sexual concupiscence might have been present in the perfect human nature in paradise, and that only later it became disobedient to human will as a result of the first couple's disobedience to God's will in the original sin. In Augustine's view, all of humanity was really present in Adam when he sinned, and therefore all have sinned. Original sin, according to Augustine, consists of the guilt of Adam which all humans inherit. As sinners, humans are utterly depraved in nature, lack the freedom to do good, and cannot respond to the will of God without divine grace. Justo Gonzalez interprets Augustine's teaching that grace is irresistible, results in conversion, and leads to perseverance. Augustine articulated his explanation in reaction to Pelagianism, which insisted that humans have of themselves, without the necessary help of God's grace, the ability to lead the morally good life and thus denied both the importance of baptism and the teaching that God is the giver of all that is good. Pelagius claimed that the influence of Adam on other humans was merely that of bad example. Augustine held that the effects of Adam's sin are transmitted to his descendants not by example but by the very fact of generation from that ancestor. A wounded nature comes to the soul and body of the new person from his, her parents, who experience libido. Augustine's view was that human procreation was the way the transmission was being affected. He did not blame, however, the sexual passion itself, but the spiritual concupiscence present in human nature, soul and body, even after baptismal regeneration. Christian parents transmit their wounded nature to children, because they give them birth, not the rebirth. Augustine used Ciceronian Stoic concept of passions, to interpret the street, Paul's doctrine of universal sin and redemption. In that view, also sexual desire itself as well as other bodily passions were a consequence of the original sin, in which pure affections were wounded by vice and became disobedient to human reason and will. As long as they carry a threat to the dominion of reason over the soul they constitute moral evil, but since they do not presuppose consent, one cannot call them sins. Humanity will be liberated from passions, and pure affections will be restored only when all sin has been washed away and ended, that is in the resurrection of the dead. Augustine believed that the only definitive destinations of souls are heaven and hell. He concluded that unbaptized infants go to hell as a consequence of original sin. The Latin church fathers who followed Augustine adopted his position, which became a point of reference for Latin theologians in the Middle Ages. In the later medieval period, some theologians continued to hold Augustine's view, others held that unbaptized infants suffered no pain at all. Unaware of being deprived of the beatific vision, they enjoyed a state of natural, not supernatural happiness. Starting around 1300, unbaptized infants were often said to inhabit the limbo of infants. The Catechism of the Catholic Church 1261 declares, as regards children who have died without baptism, the Church can only entrust him to the mercy of God, as she does in her funeral rites for them. Indeed, the great mercy of God who desires that all men should be saved, and Jesus a tenderness toward children which caused him to say, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, allow us to hope that there is a way of salvation for children who have died without baptism. All the more urgent is the Church's call not to prevent little children coming to Christ through the gift of holy baptism, but the theory of limbo. While it never entered into the dogmatic definitions of the magisterium, remains a possible theological hypothesis. Cassian in the work Sir John Cassian, Conference 13 recounts how the wise monk Cheremon, of whom he is writing, responded to puzzlement caused by his own statement that man even though he strive with all his might for a good result, 
yet cannot become master of what is good unless he has acquired it simply by the gift of divine bounty and not by the efforts of his own toil. In Chapter 11, Cassian presents Cherimon as speaking of the cases of Paul the persecutor and Matthew the publican as difficulties for those who say, the beginning, of free will is in our own power, and the cases of Zacchaeus and the good thief on the cross as difficulties for those who say, the beginning of our free will is always due to the inspiration of the grace of God, and is concluding. These two then, viz, the grace of God and free will seem opposed to each other, but really are in harmony, and we gather from the system of goodness that we ought to have both alike, lest if we withdraw one of them from man, we may seem to have broken the rule of the church's faith, for when God sees us inclined to will what is good, he meets, guides, and strengthens us. For, at the voice of thy cry, as soon as he shall hear, he will answer thee, and, Call upon me, he says, in the day of tribulation and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And again, if he finds that we are unwilling or have grown cold, he stirs our hearts with salutary exhortations, by which a good will is either renewed or formed in us. Cassian did not accept the idea of total depravity, on which Martin Luther was to insist. He taught that human nature is fallen or depraved, but not totally. Augustine Cassidy states that, at the same time, Cassian boldly asserts that God's grace, not human free will, is responsible for everything which pertains to salvation, even faith. Cassian pointed out that people still have moral freedom and one has the option to choose to follow God. Colin Lueved says that, according to Cassian, there are cases where the soul makes the first little turn, but in Cassian's view, according to Cassidy, any sparks of goodwill that may exist, not directly caused by God, a totally inadequate and only direct divine intervention ensures spiritual progress, and Lauren Pristers says that, for Cassian, salvation is from beginning to end, the effect of God's grace, church reaction opposition to Augustine's ideas about original sin, which he had developed in reaction to Pelagianism, arose rapidly. After a long and bitter struggle the general principles of Augustine's teaching were confirmed within Western Christianity by many councils, especially the Second Council of Orange in 529. However, while the Church condemned Pelagius, it did not endorse Augustine entirely and, while Augustine's authority was accepted, he was interpreted in the light of writers such as Cassian. Some of the followers of Augustine identified original sin with concupiscence in the psychological sense, but this identification was challenged by the 11th century Saint Anselm of Canterbury, who defined original sin as privation of the righteousness that every man ought to possess, thus separating it from concupiscence. In the 12th century the identification of original sin with concupiscence was supported by Peter Lombard and others but was rejected by the leading theologians in the next century, chief of whom was Thomas Aquinas. He distinguished the supernatural gifts of Adam before the fall from what was merely natural, and said that it was the former that were lost. Privileges that enabled man to keep his inferior powers in submission to reason and directed to his supernatural end. Even after the fall, man thus kept his natural abilities of reason, will and passions. Rigorous Augustine-inspired views persisted among the Franciscans, though the most prominent Franciscan theologians, such as Duns Scotus and William of Ockham, eliminated the element of concupiscence. Protestant Reformation Martin Luther asserted that humans inherit Adamite guilt and are in a state of sin from the moment of conception. The second article in Lutheranism's Augsburg Confession presents its doctrine of original sin in summary form. It is also taught among us that since the fall of Adam all men who are born according to the course of nature are conceived and born in sin, that is, all men are full of evil lust and inclinations from their mother's wombs and are unable by nature to have true fear of God and true faith in God. Moreover, this inborn sickness and hereditary sin is truly sin and condemns to the eternal wrath of God all those who are not born again through baptism in the Holy Spirit.
Rejected in this connection are the Polagins and others who deny that original sin is sin, for they hold that natural man is made righteous by his own powers, thus disparaging the sufferings and merit of Christ. Luther, however, also agreed with the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception by saying, Mary, is full of grace, proclaimed to be entirely without sin. God's grace fills her with everything good and makes her devoid of all evil. God is with her, meaning that all she did or left undone is divine and the action of God in her. Moreover, God guarded and protected her from all that might be hurtful to her. Protestant reformer John Calvin developed a systematic theology of Augustinian Protestantism by interpretation of Augustine of Hippo's notion of original sin. Calvin believed that humans inherit Adamite guilt and are in a state of sin from the moment of conception. This inherently sinful nature results in a complete alienation from God and the total inability of humans to achieve reconciliation with God based on their own abilities. Not only do individuals inherit a sinful nature due to Adam's fall, but since he was the federal head and representative of the human race, all whom he represented inherit the guilt of his sin by imputation. Redemption by Jesus Christ is the only remedy. John Calvin defined original sin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion as follows. Original sin, therefore, seems to be a hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature, diffused into all parts of the soul, which first makes us liable to God's wrath, then also brings forth in us those works which Scripture calls works of the flesh, and that is properly what Paul often calls sin. The works that come forth from it, such as adulteries, fornications, thefts, hatreds, murders, carousings, he accordingly calls fruits of sin, although they are also commonly called sins in scripture and even by Paul himself. Council of Trent The Council of Trent, while not pronouncing on points disputed among Catholic theologians, condemned the teaching that in baptism the whole of what belongs to the essence of sin is not taken away, but is only cancelled or not imputed, and declared the concupiscence that remains after baptism not truly and properly sin in the baptized, but only to be called sin in the sense that it is of sin and inclines to sin. In 1567, soon after the close of the Council of Trent, Pope Pius V went beyond Trent by sanctioning Aquinas's distinction between nature and supernature in Adam's state before the fall, condemned the identification of original sin with concupiscence, and approved the view that the unbaptized could have right use of will.